Vaughn Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, the disaster artist writers Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber. There's a different version of the disaster artist where the stakes are, do they make a good movie or a bad movie? And we were much more interested in the version that was, can this somewhat dysfunctional friendship of these two dreamers who, who you know, they're the only ones who believe in, in, in each other. No one else believes in them. Can their friendship survive the making of this movie, this, this adventure they go on? In this episode, Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber dissect The Disaster Artist and its adaptation from true events to book to film. The Disaster Artist as a, as a film had to work even if you've never heard of The Room. Which we thought was most people. We didn't know that much about it. Like the cult stuff um, was very fringy. We, we really felt like this was not a movie that was ever gonna get made if the only people who were interested in it were people who knew The Room. So we went at it pretty, you know, trying to be as global about it as we could. You haven't seen The Room, but you are reading the book before you watch it. You don't watch the movie. So what resonated in the story of The Disaster Artist as you're reading the book that made you say, yeah, let's take this project on? It, I mean, it sounds, it's, it sounds like BS, but we genuinely related to these guys. Um, we, we were very removed from Hollywood as kids, and it's all we ever kind of wanted to do with our lives, and related entirely to these guys who felt so outside of the thing that they were passionate about, um, and they had this courage to do it, uh, which we thought was like a, it's like a Rocky story. It was like, wow, these guys are heroes. Um, and that's really the, the approach that we, that we took to it. We weren't making fun of anyone. We weren't really um, talking down to anybody. Uh, it was much more about um, those guys are us. And if you know the book, um, the odd number chapters are the history of the production, and the even number chapters are the history of the friendship. And for us, we were much more interested in the, the friendship. Uh, the, 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 those were the real stakes to us. There's a different version of The Disaster Artist where the stakes are, do they make a good movie or a bad movie? And we were much more interested in the version that was, can this somewhat dysfunctional friendship of these two dreamers who, you know, they're the only ones who believe in, in, in each other. No one else believes in them. Can their friendship survive the making of this movie, this, this adventure they go on. His whole life, people tell him, you're not good enough, you'll never make it, but he doesn't listen. He saw them all. That'll be us one day, right? I, I, I hope we're not dead on the side of a road. No, not that part. That we'll be famous. We'll show them. You'll see. Yeah, maybe. No, Greg, listen. Give me Pinky. What? <laughs> What are we, 10 years old? We pinky swear. Right here, right now, we make pact. That we always push each other, that we always believe in each other, and that we will never forget dream. All right. OK? OK. Woo! The theme was very much, you know, the, the importance of surrounding yourself with people who believe in your dream. Um, and. Uh, we just thought that was something that could resonate beyond people who are fans of The Room or people who are interested in Hollywood stories. Ah! 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 
Tell me how to leave me, baby. Uh, thank you for that. These guys, I mean, they seem like the, the two least likely people to ever become actors, but for totally different reasons. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk to us about creating the spark between Greg and Tommy visually before they even have a conversation with each other, the idea behind that. I mean, it, it's interesting that each one has what the other one needs and wants. Greg is so afraid and, and uh, unsure of himself. And Tommy looks at Greg, this all-American kid, and is like, this, this guy has it all. And, and Tommy is all bravado and all courage and, and nothing else. And that's how they complement each other. They really, each one has something the other one wishes they had. And you see that before they even have a, a, a conversation between each other. Could you tell us a little bit about kind of your original idea for opening uh, the story and then how did it progress to let's jump ahead, let's start it here? Yeah, so we, we um, again, the, the, the whole spine of it is this friendship, um, and we always, this was always the dynamic Tommy opening. Um, this is how we're going to meet Tommy. He's going to put his, his hair back, and bam, there he is on stage. Um, but for Greg, we wanted to sort of, like, ease us into it um, and to get everyone to know that, like, he is um, a young guy in San Francisco. His friends are all figuring out what their lives are about, and he wants to act, and they're, they're kind of like yeah, but what are you going to do for real? Like, and no one, is, no one in his life is really um, telling him this is a viable option for you. Um, and what we realized is that you didn't need any of that. That all comes across in this scene. So instead of it being kind of like three consecutive scenes of, Greg, you're not going to do this, you could kind of do it all here, um, and it didn't really change much. I would love to hear a little bit more about the significance of actually going into Tommy's apartment. He's like a really, he's out in the world, but he's a really private person. So can you talk about the significance of actually putting this moment in his, in his, his apartment there in San Francisco? Yeah, this is what happened. I mean, a lot of it is based on real events. This was an incident, um, their first hanging out day. Um, Greg was like this. He's just so interested in this person that, and it, and I'm, I can't imagine that Tommy brought a lot of people to his place. Um, but he invited Greg back, and they went, and they sat and they talked, and and realized that like they did have some stuff in common. Um, and it was revelatory for them both because I think Tommy went into this thinking that he was being punked a little bit. He thought that Greg had some weird agenda. Why is this all-American handsome guy who want to be friends with Tommy? And and Greg legitimately. Um, wanted to know more about this guy. He was interested. He was curious. He had some kind of special sauce that he thought would help him in his in his acting. King Garden and uh, made on vacation. <laughs> uh, Tommy, where uh, where are you from? I'm New Orleans. Oh no, like uh, like originally. Yeah, that one. You know, Louisiana. Oh, okay. <laughs> The accent threw me off. <laughs> what accent? You want a red ball? Nice. When was this taken? A few years ago. Uh, really? You just, you look so young in it. Wow. Look at that. Don't be smart, guy. Oh, sorry, man. Why I'm... don't you sit down and relax? Yeah, yeah, no, that was my bad. I didn't mean to. Looking all my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. A little bit nosy guy. Yeah. I think the question everybody always had was like, why is Greg hooked his wagon to this dude? Why does he stay um, around as much as he as he does? And um, and we we kept looking for ways to show that like, you know, Tommy has there is he's weird, but like it isn't um, it's not off putting. You know, it's like there's something childlike and uh, yeah, it's a weird. <laughs> The amorphous thing we can't really describe, but when you see scenes like that, hopefully it sells you on the like, okay, yeah, I see that friendship developing. Look, there it is. That's incredible, man. Yeah. Oh, we are doing this. <laughs> we are doing this. Tomorrow, this will all be yours, Greg. Oh, we will own you, LA! Watch out, here we come. Yeah. You will know our names. I wanted to bring up this scene and, and show it because on the surface it seems like um, a, a pretty 
natural transitional scene to get down to LA and have them start their acting careers. But there was actually a lot more in the script that hewed much closer to the book. And which, that's a reshoot. Yeah, yeah. So I was gonna, I was gonna ask about that process, and um, because in the actual story, uh, Greg goes down to LA and lives in Tommy's apartment. And Tommy goes back, and there's this kind of interesting, weird kind of back and forth with them and the phones and stuff like that as Greg's trying to get his career off the ground. Greg starts to try to make it in LA on his own, and he starts taking baby steps towards having a career, finding representation, getting a small part in a in a horror film. He got a pretty big part. Yeah. It. It. it um, the problem was uh, off of Greg starting to have a little taste of success, that's what motivated Tommy to come down in LA, to L.A. Uh, and, and try again to make it as an actor. But it felt a little bit like there was already a little tension in the friendship. Um, and, and we didn't really know this until we had shot everything. It was weird to start having a little bit of problem between them before we get to the room. Dramatically, it made more sense that the relationship isn't truly tested until they decide to make this movie together. Uh, and it felt better dramatically that they get to LA together and struggle together and are kind of in the same boat of no one wants us. Um, so we had to take a little bit of dramatic license there, but it wasn't something we really fully saw until we had shot it and we were looking at the, the rough cuts and realized something's a little off. Is that one of the challenges of adapting what is, a, is essentially a true story and wanting to stay true to that story because it resonates with you and, and it feels true to their relationship and their friendship? We had so much good footage and some of the funniest stuff is the stuff that um, we couldn't use when we went in this direction, which was, which was um, you know, Tommy is in San Francisco, Greg is in LA, uh, Tommy is like on the phone, like tying up the line because he misses his best friend. And there's, but what happened was there, there was like a darkness. Um, when Greg starts getting a, man, a, a management and he starts getting stuff going on, he starts getting a little traction, um, Tommy's not happy about it. And um, it was, it, when you watched the movie, it was way too early for that. Um, especially if this is a story about these two guys and their and their friendship being tested, that whoever's right, the, the the room is what tests them. We don't want to see um, elements of that earlier, and so we we really kind of um, had to sacrifice some of our funniest stuff um, to to tell the story that we had set out to tell. Okay, today our top of mountain day. Today we take first steps on a great journey. After today, which one of our cells will ever be same? This play work if chemistry between character makes sense. Human behavior, betrayal, it applies to all of us. It's in our cells. You love someone, what is love? You need to have spirit, hope, be optimist. But can you handle all your human behavior and behavior of others. Right? Right? See what I'm saying? You don't want to be good. You want to be great. Tommy's speech is brilliant. Can you share with us the origins of this speech? Oh, yeah. So the, every copy of the room that was given to the actors had that on the front page. That was the first page. Um, I think we took a little bit of dramatic license, but Tommy wrote 99% of that dialogue, as you probably can tell. Um, and we just sort of made it a speech instead of it being on, on the script. But yeah, the cover page of everything um, said exactly that. Do you know what any of it means? We just always thought it was amazing that he, he, he kept referring to the screenplay as the play, and a lot of the actors thought they were doing a play. They didn't know there would be cameras. Um, he did have a documentary footage guy following him around um, to, to videotape stuff because um, he thought that the, one day there would be a behind the scenes of the making of, and he was right. Um, and uh, yeah. I think like a lot of things, Tommy, he, he, there, there's the dual intention with Tommy, which is do as I say, but please love me and maybe be my best friend. And, it kind of is straddling both those things when he's giving that speech. He wants respect, and as an artist and as a leader, he doesn't quite know how to earn it. Uh, and, and that will be the tension throughout production. And when you were reading the book and you read about the toilet being installed on set, I mean, <laughs> what? Because... <laughs> 
unless this was a movie about making the room that like just seems like that's a step too far, but he actually had a toilet plumb. Yeah, in we this couldn't set. make that stuff up. That was that was one of the challenges of adapting. If we had used all the crazy little things like that, uh, this would have been a six-hour miniseries. Uh, Tommy was. Uh, he would never valet his car because he would accuse the valet of farting in the car. <laughs> like that, that's amazing. And we just, there was nowhere to, there's nowhere to put that. And there were, so we just had to cherry pick the stuff. I mean, the toilet thing worked here on day one because it actually happened. But a lot of great Tommy anecdotes had to go by the wayside. I think we tried to put as many in as we could, and then if it felt shoehorned or forced, then we had to take it out. You having not seen the movie, um, if I had to explain anything to you, and I had to say, like, no, this is so funny, but I, it took a lot of, like, um, somersaults to explain it, then we couldn't use it. So those were the things that had to be excised. Alfred Hitchcock, let me tell you something, Greg. He do this movie, Birds. Yeah, I'm aware of the birds. On this movie, he terrify actors. He locked them in rooms. He throw he throw birds at them. Real birds, d d nasty stuff. Oh. The actors they cry every day. But this movie win every award. Is Mr. Hitchcock bad man? No, he great director. Uh, yeah, but he was an. I bet he didn't direct with his. Out. Oh really? Well, maybe we check the record, okay? okay? And you know, for your information, the word director come from dictator. Rest my case. You can't treat them like this. It's not right. I treat them how I treat them. If anyone needs to be upset here, it's me, quite frankly. What? Why give them job? I give them salary. How do you spend five million dollars on this movie, Greg? Five? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Five million dollars? And what? they are not grateful. Nobody respect my vision. I know what they say, Greg. I hear them. This scene pulls together a lot of different threads from the actual story um, and pulls them all together tightly right here in this one scene. And, um, and it becomes this emo big emotional impact and is a turning point for a lot of the characters. So I was wondering, during your writing process, when did you envision pulling all those threads together specifically in this particular scene? We were cherry picking, like we said, from all those odd chapters. <clears throat> and we were like, okay, we got to have a, a, what's the high sort of pinnacle moment of the disaster of the disaster artist? Um, and it's when Tommy kind of like just goes off the rails. He's, he's a, um, you know, uh, totally paranoid with good reason. Um, and, and like Weber said, he does genuinely want people to love him, but he crossed over into a place where he knew that nobody did. And it was sort of painful to him. And, and he doesn't come back from that darkness. Um, and there's a lot of comedy going on there, a lot of things that are inappropriate and, and awful. Uh, and we had no idea if it was all going to work together. Um, and then James was like, I'm doing it in one take. I'm going to just do it with like a camera. And we're like, Jesus. And the other so. part of this that's not pictured, obviously, is if you know the movie, um, Greg's relationship with Amber is getting more serious at this point. So here's Tommy starting to feel threatened by Greg's relationship with this woman. And... I think Tommy's working some of that out in this scene as well. I think it, this movie strikes a really fine balance about are we laughing because it's funny or are we laughing at Tommy and what does it say about us? Yeah, and the other really interesting thing that we didn't have anything to do with is I think Franco's performance makes you care about this guy in a way that, um, you know, if he didn't, a lot of things would fall apart. Um, and, you know, in the, what Tommy's doing in the scene is bad. We should be on, we, you know, we're on Greg's side. <clears throat> but, but when the scene happens, I do think you are tracking with, uh, with Tommy enough to know sort of where it's coming from and at least um, understanding and comprehending why he's behaving so badly. Uh, and you care about him and you want him to stop it. Um, as opposed to, you know, what you were saying before, which is just run, get away from this. Um, and that, I think, is really to, to credit uh, James and, and what he's doing in that, in that role. Why, Lisa, why, why? <laughs> How often do you think Hitchcock got a response like this? No.
The ending has evolved from the original shooting script, so I just wonder if you could talk to us about um, how this was originally scripted and then the decision to get it to, to, the, to the, the way we see it now in the final film. Um, the, the, one of the bigger changes that, that um, we made was um, Greg walks out of the theater in the original script because um, he can't watch anymore. It's too painful. And he goes to the restroom, and there's an agent character who had been, who had been sent... Um, or just decided, you know, he has to check out all the stuff. And he, and it's played by Tim Simmons from, from Veep, who's so great. Uh, and the agent is like on the phone being like, I just saw the biggest piece of shit. It was, it was, you can't even believe it. And really just slagging off on the movie. And Greg can't help but be like, say all the things that he, that he says to Tommy here of like, what have you ever made? Like you, and, and, and really like Greg believed that. Um, and it was a lovely scene, and it was, and it was, it did what it needed to do. Um, but when we watched the movie and realized that that the friendship is the paramount thing that um, that we need to to have here, the decision was made to have Tommy hear Greg say those things, um, and so that became a very important thing. Greg had to say them to Tommy. Um, as opposed to having the audience hear it and never know if Tommy and Greg ever had that kind of thing. Um, so we you know, whipped up a new version of it, and, uh, and I think the ending works much better in this kind of like friendship, uh, you and me against the world kind of uh, story. The thing we always had, though, um, we had to uh, take some dramatic license to truncate the room being appreciated for what it is, after they wrap shooting, Greg and Tommy are apart, and we show that. Um, and, and, and the friendship has dissolved. Uh, in real life, the premiere was a disaster, and people trickled out, and the theater was mostly empty by the time the movie ended. And then it wasn't until uh, film students in L.A. discovered the room and started going to these empty showings and bringing their friends and their friends' friends that it was... Uh, embraced the way you see the audience embracing it. The problem was, uh, dramatically, we weren't going to have Tommy and Greg apart. The premiere is a disaster. They're still apart. And then slowly it starts to build up steam by word of mouth. It's, it's not it, that cinematic. Yeah, that's not. And, and one of the things we've learned over the years is sort of um, know when to get to the curtain. And if this story is about this friendship and not about the triumph of the movie, um, resolving and repairing that friendship, the fact that Tommy has given Greg so much and Greg gives a, a really valuable gift back to Tommy at the end here, Greg teaches Tommy how to embrace the movie as a, as a win. Um, felt like a really nice way to sort of repair their bond. And it's funny because when we were reading the book and, and we spent a lot of time talking to Greg uh, while making the movie and while shooting the original ending, and Greg was always very much like, yeah, Tommy and I aren't as close as we once were and sort of, you know, I, I, he's moved on. And, you know, as we spent more time with Greg and, and then eventually Tommy became a part of things, we realized that wasn't so true. These guys still talk every day. Tommy still calls him his best friend. Greg kind of treats Tommy like a best friend. Um, so this ending felt more right, ultimately, once we actually got to know the guys a little bit. You've been watching The Disaster Artist, a conversation with Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 